Scotland is not a poor country, but progress has been made in the last 20 years or so in reducing poverty in, in certain areas, for some for the very young, some for the very old in our community. But we're not without poverty, and it's a continually changing picture as to where the most deprived sectors are. Still, thousands of children are waking up every day homeless. That shouldn't be in a modern Scotland. Still, thousands of working households are struggling to survive and to live adequate lives. There are huge attainment gaps in education and in health. And still, all too often, where you're born in Scotland dictates how your life is going to turn out. So, a Scotland without poverty, what will it take? Between you and our esteemed members on the panel here and from the Joseph Rowntree Foundation, we've got an hour to sort it. Easy. <laughs> and let me say first off that this event is being streamed live online by Third Force News. So if there's anyone here who absolutely does not want to be on camera, can you please make yourself known early on at the start so that we can make sure you're kept, kept free from shot. Um, I'm going to run through the proceedings. Uh, later this year, the Joseph Rowntree Foundation will be publishing the results of more than two years of solid work and research on tackling poverty. Um, that will be for the whole of the UK. It will be a very major and sustained piece of work. Um, but as a precursor to that, and with the Scottish elections looming, 11 weeks tomorrow they are, um, today Joseph Rowntree Foundation is publishing this, its Scottish manifesto, that you are the first to, to get glimpses of it. Um, we'll hear much more about that in just a moment from Jim. And once Jim has spoken to you, and we've had a very personal account of what it's like living in poverty, we'll hear from our three other speakers, panel members here, and then I'll throw the floor open to you for around, hopefully, 30, 35 minutes of discussion. So no heckling, please, while our speakers are speaking, but please... <coughs> Don't be backward in coming forward later because the success of events like this really depends very much on you and how much you're prepared to put into it and get out of it. So take notes by all means and have your questions ready for the 30 minutes or so of our debating time. Now, to kick us off, I've said that the Scottish Manifesto is just being published today. To that end, we have the Associate Director for Scotland of the Joseph Rowntree Foundation, Jim McCormick. He's our first speaker. Jim is a member of the Social Security Advisory Committee. He's on the board of Scottish Business in the Community. He's advised government, the voluntary sector, and independent funders. In a previous life, he was director of the independent think tank, the Scottish Council Foundation. You'll find out more about him, I'm sure, from his own chat. He cites his main work interests as tackling poverty, which is why we're here today, changing jobs market and well-being in later life. I have a stake in that one. Outside work, Jim cites his interests as music languages and the fortunes of Greenock Morton Football Club. <laughs> so if you see him wandering off and his gaze leaving you at any stage, I would say he's concentrating not necessarily just on a strategy for taking Scotland out of poverty, but on how Greenock Morton are going to fare against Celtic uh, in their Scottish Club Port Brown um, match on the 5th of March, is it not, Jeff? <laughs> That's the amount of research I've done before coming along today. <laughs> Please give our first speaker, Jim McCormick, a very warm welcome. Sally, without, <clears throat> without exception, that's the finest introduction I've ever had. Um, we are still in the cup, perhaps not for long. Far more importantly, um, when we walked into this room a few minutes ago and it was empty, we did think, did we make the right decision <laughs> booking this cavernous space? Um, and the fact that you've chosen to come here, chosen to explore this question with us together, um, and get into what we hope will be some very practical ideas which we could be taking forward now with existing powers and budgets as well as in the future um, in all parts of Scotland, in all sectors, um, is really heartening for us. Um, so thank you for coming, first of all. Um, I'm going to be very brief and just say a few words about what is a very complicated story, as you know, and our manifesto, which is a snapshot of which, what is a very... Um, uh, detailed review of evidence and set of uh, 
ideas and modeling and costings to come. So why fight poverty? I guess I don't have to persuade anyone in this room why we should do that, but our answers are because poverty in Scotland is costly. Um, it costs a great deal of money for countries to run high levels of poverty. It's risky. Um, we carry all sorts of risks that uh, go along with living your life, certainly for a long period, below the poverty line in health and care and other parts of our system. Lots of cost shunting all over the place that results from high levels of poverty. It's also wasteful, immensely wasteful of human potential. But perhaps the most important reason why we should, why we should fight poverty is because it's not inevitable. How often do we hear from politicians, some parts of the press, the very lazy idea that there's nothing we can do. The poor are always with us. It's always the same families, always the same neighborhoods, which flies in the face of what we know about the modern face of poverty today, where people are in and out of work. Um, they are in the private rented sector. They're paying high rents. These kind of risks are passed increasingly towards the under 35s in our society. That wasn't true 20 years ago. Um, this is a changing picture. Um, there are some bleak aspects to it and there are some hopeful aspects to it. And I think it's all of our responsibility to tip the scales towards affordable, practical ways of putting Scotland on a pathway to sustainably and substantially lower poverty. Um, if there's one sentence to sum up our message, we know a lot about what it takes to reduce poverty, so let's go on and do it. Um, I'm not going to try and summarise what's in our manifesto statement, far less what's to come later in the year, but a couple of things we would say is that because the drivers of poverty, the root causes in Scotland and as elsewhere, are multiple, it's what's happening in low-paid work and inadequate hours. It's what's happening in, with high rents, eye-watering childcare costs, unfair energy tariffs. Um, because all these things bear down upon the lives of people on a low income before we even factor in um, the sanctions regime in the welfare system, inadequacy of key working age benefits. When you crunch all these things together, what it tells us is, because the root causes are so diverse, our solutions have to be equally diverse. So although what government does and what parliaments do, what our tax and benefit systems do, are absolutely at the center of this, we also have to be raising our expectations about what employers can contribute to tackling poverty, even if we have to use different language about what housing providers in all sectors can contribute, the role of schools in closing the attainment gap, and so forth. So um, the next Scottish Government, we might think we know who it will be, but the next Scottish Government and local authorities elected the next year um, have a key responsibility to shape the response um, but we should be looking outwards. We should be asking questions of banks and utilities and insurers, as well as some of the others I've mentioned. A couple of ideas that we say specifically in our manifesto before we move on and talk about some in more depth. On childcare, our modelling and our estimates tell us that over the next 10 years, Scotland probably needs to go from half of 1% of our wealth being spent on childcare 2.85%. In absolute terms, that's an extra half billion pounds of expenditure we need to be finding to invest in childcare. And not putting it into the existing system, putting it into a reform system, where quality is the main driver, rather than simply expanding the number of free hours available. Where parental involvement is a key driver, because when childcare settings are truly in a relationship with families, we get better outcomes. And we're driving up workforce training and standards and pay. It's a key driver as well. Um, we think that all childcare funding should be devolved to Scotland sooner rather than later, even if not in this Scotland bill, which would give us a chance of doing something like that Denmark does, of having a single supply-side funding system capping costs at 10% for the majority of families 
and motoring with the anti-poverty contribution of childcare. What else do we see? Briefly, on work, three sectors of the economy in Scotland account for half of all low pay. Staggering. The care economy, retail, hotels and catering. We think the next Scottish Government should be proactive in targeting those sectors, make an offer around support with training and other particular costs, but also making more of an ask, yes, to pay living wage, but to go beyond that, improve training guarantees, um, improve access to progression. We talk about building an advancement service in Scotland, putting a spotlight upon in-work poverty, a spotlight upon those people who are stuck in low-paid work or cycling in and out of low-paid work or who have poor English, poor skills and who are not going to be progressing unless we take action. So yes, we should improve the pathway into work for people but not leave them there and abandon them there in low-paid work. There's a lot more um, in our manifesto. We'll hear some of it on childcare and housing and critically reducing costs um, if families in a low income, either incomes or squeezed, then let's do all we can to drive down the costs they face. Energy, credit, childcare, rents. That's the flavour of what we say in our work. You'll also find on your table um, a summary of some work we've done very recently in Scotland by Maggie Kelly, who's in the audience looking at ethnicity and poverty and what we can do around the qualities more widely. Um, I hope you will uh, read what we've written, I hope you'll enjoy it, I hope you'll have ideas to improve it and I hope we'll get to work with many of you this year and beyond on those practical solutions to deliver across all of Scotland. Thank you very much for listening. Jim, thank you. Now, if you work in politics or the third sector or social services or education, journalism, we might all think that we know a bit about poverty. We might think we know a bit about poverty in Scotland and how some people's lives really are. But I think for most of us, we are simply kidding ourselves. You have no idea unless you've been there yourself. And our next speaker has been there. She grew up in the east end of Glasgow. She is now the Poverty Truth Commissioner. And I'd like you to please give a very, very warm welcome to Donna Barraclou. Well, I'm very privileged to be here today to speak on behalf of the communities in East End. Um, I take in part, um, the reason why I'm here today is because I'm part of an organisation called the Poverty Truth Commission, which is a group of people who live and work with everyday poverty, live in poverty areas, sitting down talking to the decision makers, the councillors, the um, land environmental services, other people who make the decisions in our communities. We get to sit down and we work out some strategies, how best to improve the problems that are going on. Um, I'm quite feeling quite nervous, because I need to bear with me, this is not my everyday thing. But anyway, um, I see myself as a veteran, either living in a poor area, you know, because I feel it's a war against the poor. So when the poverty truth came up, I was thinking, that's good, that gives us a voice, because I worked in a church and I couldn't get any funding for anything. All the clubs I wanted to do healthy eating classes and bring back the values for the 60s. You know, like, when the tellies came in, the values went out, I think. When people had pianos and sat down. So I was trying to set this up in my communities, but I found the barriers to getting funding, and there was barriers to everything. So when I joined the Poverty Truth Commission, I was actually sitting with people who could actually help. So. I got a group of kids um, that had previously went with the church to Africa and we got them up on the stage to see how they felt less intimidated walking about in Africa than they did walking about from area to area because they had been, because of boundaries, you know, like gang fighting and things like that. They felt imprisoned where they live. So there they, there they were in Malawi where they don't have running water, they don't have proper education, but the kids all had hope. And our kids were like, how are they happier than us? And that's what we had to ask ourselves. How are they happier than us, no? But anyway, so the public truth opened up the, the gates and the kids went for there and then they started sitting down with the police. And, it, and they were, um, so it was kind of a, like a unit against um, violence reduction unit. 
and they were and they discussed like running a football team where the police and different peoples in the communities could come together for a football tournament and things like that. Um, but instead of playing against each other, taking one pose, one person for that era, one person for that era, and getting them to play in the same team so they get to know each other. So we had a lot of wee pilot schemes like that. One of the best works we done was working with the kinship carers. The kinship carers, when we met them, never had a say. They never had anybody hearing their voices. I know everybody knows who the kinship carers are, and that was working and allowed, and we got legislation changed. Um, we've had a lot of the stuff that we were working on has actually went into place, and it's changed and made it a better place. We can, I can now access some, something that's going on in the West End if they've got better facilities and get them to come to the, Easter, to the East End. Whereas before, we could only get what was on. So I can now get drummers in and I can now get much more lively, exciting things going on in my community. Um, so, um, but I'm here today, because the day's about solutions. So my solution is we need to work back and bring back values into our communities. I know, being in a poor community, we are stigmatised, this, that and that. But there's a few geniuses and a few clever folk come out of these areas. People need to remember where their fire, brigade, comfy, they're all coming from communities. So we need to stop looking at the differences and start looking at the, what we can do to be united, you know, to be a community. Again, I'm proud to be Scottish. I love what we bring. But my daughter's just went to Australia. She's 20. She's gone to do with all the other kids at 20 days, I mean, go to uni or finish. But I want her to have reasons to go back to this country. I want her to feel like she wants to come back here and there's good things to do. That there isn't a war against the poor. There isn't a them and us, that we're actually the one party. We're Scottish, we're British, we're the same. We can look at, um, I don't know, I keep hearing Woody Guthrie song, do you know what I mean? Can I be much more like, Oh, I kind of think of the words now. But anyway, um, it's a song against the war, do you know what I mean? So, um, but the public truth gave us legs and gave us strength. And the people who we worked with, like John Carnican, Big Head Police, Jim Wallace, I mean, we had some real class people there. They felt it was invaluable getting the information for the communities to see that there is still quality. It's worth the fight. We are all the same. We all eat and breathe. We all need the same needs and we need to be accepted. We don't need the finger pointed at us. Um, my ideas are to just get some music going in your music workshops, get rid of the tellies and get your pianos back in your houses. No? If I could get my way, that's where it would be. Stop feeding the wains crap. Why is there no better legislation on the food that your wains are getting? Dinner schools used to be brilliant. What do they know? There's nothing in them. We need to look at things like that. And, in poverty, we, we, do, we do need to look at all the areas, not just the price. We need to look at the price of childcare. We need to look at the price of food and how is it so cheap? You know, it's suspicious why you can get a steak at £2.50 with all the trimmings. Do you know what I mean? You need to. So, people, and worst of all, I feel people need to know. I feel it's a war, but only because we're made to feel it's the individual's fault. It's a global phenomenon, poverty. It's not just us. It's not just us in East End. It's not just us in Glasgow. It's actually the whole world's problem. So thank you for listening. That's a pretty good way to start off the afternoon, isn't it? Thank you very much, Donna. Well done. Well, now time for our panel of speakers. Um, they will all be telling us a bit about their experiences, maybe their solutions, some practical things that have worked for them, and perhaps what their views are on the manifesto that they've had a quick glimpse of. Um, I will remind them all that time is tight, uh, five minutes maximum for each of you. I do have the yellow card here, and I do came armed with, it, with a dinger, just in case. No red cards here. So let me introduce them briefly, and I'll let you just follow on from yourselves. Um, on your right, on, no, on your, yeah, on your right and my right is Satwat Raymond, who's worked in the voluntary and public sector in the, all over the UK for the last quarter of a century. Since 2011, she's been director of One Parent Family Scotland. She's worked very hard over the years to develop 
child, children's services both in Scotland and England and is a member of the Child Care Alliance's Commission for Child Care Reform. These are just a few of the strings to Satwat's bow. Um, next to, to Satwat is Susan Aptomel, an award-winning entrepreneur and founder of Impact Arts, which is now a national charity. Uh, with that, she created the Fab Pad program for um, supporting vulnerable people to sustain tenancies through interior designs. She's passionate about the housing sector, I think it's fair to say, and working with landlords and social enterprise suppliers. She herself is an experienced landlord and property owner. Um, leading delivery of homes for good as it starts and creating jobs in the sector for people with relevant expertise, but in particular, homes for good is trying to prioritize getting the unemployed back into work in that sector. And on your far left and my far right, Sharon McPherson, who was appointed the CEO of Scott Cash two years ago. Uh, Sharon has worked very much in the financial sector and the inclusion in the sector for more than 20 years, working in money and also debt advice. She's involved in developing and delivering recommendations for quality standards, access for BME communities, debt arrangement schemes, and much more besides that she will tell you about in her own time. But let me first please ask Satwa to kick us off. Thank you very much. Um, within the five minutes I've got, I don't really have time to go in detail through the manifesto that JRF have launched here today, but I just want to say I welcome what's in the manifesto. I welcome the sort of integrated approach in there, the all ages approach, and I think that recognises that we need to be looking at all services and issues together in a holistic way and not to think about them in isolation. I'm going to focus on childcare and again I welcome what's said in, in the manifesto, the clarity of purpose, the outcomes and the recommendations and it chimes very closely with the report from the Commission for Childcare Reform. And what particularly struck me about what Jim said was that we know what it takes, let's get on and do it. And that's really been the way I feel personally and many colleagues feel about childcare. We've been discussing what the issues are for 30, 40 years now. We just need to look at how we get on and do it. We know what we have to do. We need childcare that's flexible, that's high quality, accessible, affordable and available. We know why it improves outcomes for children. If it's of high quality, it can help with raising attainment. For parents, it can support them into employment, training and education. If we keep the costs low, particularly or free for those on the lowest incomes, it can reduce in work poverty. One of the things we hear time and again from the families we work with is the cost of childcare and how it's prohibitive for them when they're looking for work but within the current welfare reforms, they have no choice about work, so they're finding themselves in situations where it's costing them to work. And it creates a place and a community. We know how, and some of that's been set out in this manifesto, simplifying funding, a greater investment, looking at how to make the provision sustainable through supply side funding, investing in and valuing the workforce because they're key to the quality of what's going to be provided, and ensuring we've got a local infrastructure of providers who are linked in with other services. And I think that's critical, because otherwise we're just going to go back to siloed service delivery. So what's stopping us, other than the fact that it is going to cost? But then the question asked was, what's the cost of not doing it? And that's something we need to ask ourselves. I think part of why we keep stalling around childcare is that we see these social outcomes we're trying to achieve as being in competition with each other. Is it quality versus flexibility? Raising attainment versus in, um, increasing employment? Is it children versus families? Well, children live in families and we need to look at the type of approach we take to support the whole family. And the thing is, it's complicated. Currently, we have supply and demand side funding mechanisms which sit across the Scottish Government and the Westminster Government, and quite often there's conflicting agendas as to what we want to use childcare for. Now, in terms of our role in it as an organisation at One Parent Family Scotland, we've been working over the past four or five years to look to see how we can develop flexible, high-quality childcare. And we've come up with a model which 
which provides care in the home for families, offers creches and provides staff to support drop-ins where parents are undertaking other activities, has flexible daycare, which does pick-ups during the course of the day, does after school, and then at the end of the day can do home-based care again. And it's about how you provide packages tailored for individual families. For example, for the home-based care, we've got some single-parent families who we're supporting who are doing shift work or on zero-hours contracts. Because no matter what we think about those working patterns, they're the reality of many of the families that we work with at the moment. So we've got a family who may only need care one day a month, one month, but might need it five times a week, the second month. And so what we've developed is a pay-for-what-you-use system, which is expensive to run because you need consistency in staffing to ensure con continuity of care for children. You need to overstaff to make sure the availability is there for families at short notice. So you need to develop it so it meets children's needs and is fit for family circumstances, because that's what it's going to take to support families out of poverty, increase children's attainment, and develop that community cohesion which Donna spoke about, so it doesn't become a them and us situation. So, it's, like I said, it's not cheap to run, but nor should it be. I think childcare needs to have the quality and status that we give to education, to school-aged education. It needs to be seen as part of the fabric of our communities, and it needs to be responsive. Like, for example, at the moment, under universal credit, from 2017, if you're a single parent with a child who's three or four years old, there's going to be increased conditionality on you in terms of being available for work and in work. So we can't wait until the end of the next parliament to have an increase in hours for three and four-year-olds. We need to look to see what the needs are currently and how we're meeting those needs. And the final point I want to make is the universal versus targeted debate that's been going on within tackling poverty and within childcare also. And I want to think about the two-year-old offer, which currently at the moment is for two-year-olds from workless households or vulnerable two-year-olds. And the example I want to give is when we're trying to think about how we meet that need within the system we've got, we've ended up in the situation where we've got two-year-olds going into settings for three and four-year-olds. And in some communities, they may be the only two-year-olds in those settings, and that's what's stopping the families from using it. They don't want to be the ones who are being identified as such. So that's the system we need to set up that's universal, that's fairly funded, and that doesn't cost people more than they can afford, if anything at all. Thank you. Satwa, thank you very much. <laughs> Susan, let's hear it from a housing perspective. Thank you. I'm just going to very quickly outline um, what Homes for Good does and talk a little bit about the private rented sector, which is what my focus is, and just how that fits with some of the recommendations in the manifesto. Um, I, I set up Homes for Good in 2013, yeah, three years ago, 2013, um, as a frustrated landlord who couldn't find a good letting agency and was becoming increasingly concerned about the way that landlords and tenants were treated in the private rented sector. And with my background in social enterprise and my experience of working with people um, in sort of social need, um, I realised that there was probably something that I could do about that. Um, so I set up the first letting agency in the country to be run as a social enterprise which focuses on ethics and transparency both for landlords and tenants and focuses on quality in terms of quality of management and also quality of property that's, that's on offer. Um, we currently manage about 260 houses across West and Central Scotland or properties um, for a variety of different landlords. Um, in 2014 uh, I started the quest to secure investment to actually buy property ourselves and to date we have raised about six million pounds and we've bought 100 properties of our own um, the plan is to raise another six million pounds and have 250 properties by 2018 and what we're doing with those properties is is creating a positive discrimination for people in, in, in very low, on low incomes and housing benefits. So we, on those, that particular um, part of our organisation, we only let to people who most other letting agents and landlords will say no to. And the focus is on quality of care and quality of property. 
The situation with the private rented sector is very critical. It's at a very critical point in Scotland, and um, the private rented sector is often demonised. Um, I'd be very um, interested and, and welcome your thoughts and comments on that. Um, the snapshot is that there are about 380,000 private rented sector households in Scotland. There are more private rented sector households than there are housing association ones, which may be a surprise. However, there are 260,000-ish owners. That means that the bulk of these properties, so there's 260,000 landlords and there's 380,000 or so properties. That is a massively fragmented housing sector. It's a massive sector and it's very fragmented. The challenges around that are around condition of property, compliance of landlords, often down to lack of education, sometimes down to lack of resources. And um, we absolutely support the, 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 the moves of the Scottish Government and it, I think it's been welcomed as well um, in the manifesto to improve the private rented sector by regulation of letting agents and the changes to tenancy um, regime that improves security for tenants. However, the private re one of the critical things in the private rented sector is affordability for people on low incomes. There are 33% of people in the private rented sector um, are on housing benefit. Now, unfortunately, our experience of that is that those, that 33% will have very limited choice in the sorts of properties they can access and the quality could be, not always, but could be very questionable. And that was what we really wanted to try and uh, tackle with um, the portfolio that we've created. We know from our own um, evidence of doing mystery shopping as a tenant on housing benefit, how badly they can be treated sometimes when they make an inquiry about a property, but, and I can go into more about that another time. Um, in terms of, of, of the, the manifesto and what it's saying about housing, we absolutely welcome the, the different recommendations and suggestions, but I think there are three things that I want to point out about that. First of all, um, the, the, as I said earlier, the private rented sector is very complex. Um, it feels to me like at a UK government level and at a Scottish government level, the current structure of the PRS is being dismantled um, through the tax. There are, there are a couple of tax changes, both within Scottish government and uh, uh, the UK government, which is making it increasingly difficult for buy-to-let landlords to exist. Now, while you might welcome that and so on one hand, if we reduce the private rented sector supply without replacing house for house with a social house, we're going to end up with a critical homelessness situation. That's what's going to happen. And it feels to me like the UK and Scottish governments are not taking enough understanding of the, the, the unintended consequences of this. There is also a critical issue around fuel poverty. We provide high quality homes that our tenants cannot afford to heat. And that, that then creates issues around dampness and mould and condensation that affects health. And that is something we all need to address. The whole issue around green incentives for landlords is complex and we need to find a simpler way of enabling landlords to improve their homes. My final point is that local authorities, as is pointed out in the manifesto, do have the ability to, to enforce and improve conditions and they're not doing enough with that. So really, our core belief is that home is the foundation for your life and we want to do everything we can to make sure that that happens for people. Thank Susan, you. thank you very much. Now let's hear from Sharon about how Scott Cash works. Thank you. We're delighted to be here today supporting Joseph Rowntree Foundation Anti-Poverty Plan and um, welcome all the recommendations within, within the plan and particularly applaud the Foundation for recognising the importance of financial exclusion within the poverty agenda and its importance in relation to the poverty premium. Um, financial exclusion hurts individuals, it hurts communities and it hurts our economy. So it's really important that we're able to address the issues of low income groups being unable to access the most basic of financial products and services. So taking banking exclusion, for example, we have in Glasgow alone 21,000 individuals who are unbanked. And those individuals are unbanked either because they can't get a bank account, because the bank won't give them a bank account, or they've had a bank account in the past and been, um, had a bad experience with that account. 
And if you don't have a bank account to manage your daily financi uh, finances, there's real knock-on effects to that. So, for example, if you live in a cash economy, you're more um, vulnerable to um, theft or loss of cash. You will be charged, charged exorbitant amounts to cash checks. You won't be able to take advantage of online shopping deals. You won't be able to take advantage of direct debit discounts, for example, paying for fuel. And many low-income groups without bank accounts um, have to use prepayment meters, which cost on average an extra £140 a year. So there are real significant issues with not having a bank account. There are barriers to getting a bank account. Lots of banks don't advertise to low-income groups, so it's all online. High street branches are very um, sophisticated and slightly intimidating potentially to low-income groups. Low-income groups feel that they wouldn't have the necessary documentation to open a bank account. So, for example, a passport or other photographic ID. So, again, low-income groups feel that bank accounts are not for them, they're not available to them, and we need to start to address um, that issue specifically with banks. We very much welcome the recommendations in the anti-poverty plan to compel banks to release data on the applications that they, they receive for bank accounts, looking at where we might target promotion of bank accounts for communities where low-income uh, households are living, um, but also where they are declining bank accounts. There's been some really good um, legislation and directives from the EU um, recently on access to bank accounts, which have resulted in many of the major banks in the UK now making fee-free bank accounts available, but we have got a long way to promote them to low-income groups and give low-income groups the confidence to use those products where they, they don't need to fear the issue of bank charges. If you have a £12 bank charge on an income of £75, that's fairly significant for your day-to-day -day, um, finances. So that poverty premium in terms of not having a bank account is significant. In addition to not being banked, many low-income groups find it extremely difficult to access small-sum credit. So if you were to approach your bank and look for a loan of less than £1,000, you would probably not find any bank willing to lend you that. So many low-income groups, if they find themselves in the situation where they have an emergency, say their washing machine is broken down, they have no option but to go to high-cost non-standard lenders to meet that need. If they're a member of a credit union and they've been able to save in advance, then they can go to their credit union. But in many cases, they have to go to doorstep lenders or rent-to-buy establishments. And just to give you an indication of exactly what that means, if you wanted to borrow £500 from a doorstep lender, you would be paying back in total £910. That's £410 in interest alone. And I'm sure that there's many people in this room that wouldn't expect to pay that level of interest on that level of loan. So it's important that we actually address access to affordable credit. And we very much welcome the recommendations in the report to build capacity for social finance providers to build up their um, ability to uh, meet the needs of low-income groups. Thank you very much indeed. So I haven't even had to use the dinger. Mm -hmm. Well, now it's over to you. Um, we've not got as much time as maybe I'd hoped for, but we have got 15, 20 minutes. Um, we'll, if there are a lot of questions, then we'll keep the answers fairly short, but I hope you'll keep them coming thick and fast. I know you've not had long, you've not had any time to look at the manifesto itself, but you have heard from Jim and you've heard from our three speakers. When you're giving a question, making a point, giving a comment, can you, you make yourself known to us, we'll get a microphone to you and then just tell us who you are and whether or not you are representing yourself or an organisation. So can I have our first question please? Yes, we'll get the mic to you, just hang on. Hi, um, I'm Danielle, I'm just representing myself at the moment. Um, it was Fantastic to hear from Donna. Thank you very much for sharing that. Um, I think that the manifesto looks really good and I'm interested in knowing how it's going to be put out there so that people on low incomes can get access to it and be aware of the issues and join in on the campaign if possible. 
Thank you very much for that comment. That was very encouraging, I'm sure. Do we have a question? Has, has anybody take it, said something that you want to take issue with this afternoon? Do we have anyone that has solutions? I think what we're looking for is, you know, we, the politicians over the next few weeks, you're going to have the next 11 weeks, as I said, to put your politicians on the spot and to question them about their solutions for housing, childcare, low-income families, but quick-fix solutions and political answers are, are one thing. That's not what tackling poverty should be about in Scotland. What, what is needed is long-term, sustained, continued solutions that may cost but will also work. And, and uh, Jim, I think you would agree that it's not just up to politicians to find those fixes, be they quick fixes or preferably long term. It's, it's up to all of us. It's up, up to us to put pressure on business and on the third sector. And I mean, what, what you're wanting, we, we can't just blame it all on bad politics, can we, Jim? Uh, well, we could, but I think that would be um, <laughs> a little bit unfair. Uh, just to come back to the very good question that was asked, so I'll stand up. Um, over the next nine months or so, uh, we want to um, use this as a foundation to build something better, something more powerful, and to do that with the Poverty Truth Commission, Poverty Alliance, and others. Um, some, uh, many of the ideas, actually, that we've come up with so far are not simply the work of researchers and academics. You know, we've road tested our ideas around employment, for example, in Glasgow with people who have been job seekers and people who have been through the work program and had good, bad and ugly tales to tell about it. Um, so we're trying to build in um, you know, direct voice, not just to our events, but to building the ideas. And what you see today is, I, I guess, the end of phase one, um, but it will only be uh, powerful and effective if it's put alongside your ideas, if it's put alongside Naomi Eisenstadt's report from last month, uh, the independent advisor on poverty and inequality in Scotland. Um, and just back to this point that Sally was raising. Um, so we talk in this report, for example, about holding banks to account. Now, of course, it's fair to say the Scottish Parliament does not have regulatory powers over the banking industry, but there's nothing to stop us saying that as a society, the standards we expect to apply in Scotland are around, as a minimum, transparency of information. As a minimum, that we understand how banks are, ben banks are benchmarking against each other on, on making available, freely available, good basic banking products without putting unfair identity requirements in the way of people who don't have passports, for example. I think there's something in here about a more courageous approach to the private sector. We may be surprised that there are some interesting allies out there. And the balance here is not in any way about expecting less of government or parliament, we should expect more of them, but at the same time, leave space for others to contribute more as well. Thanks, Jim. I'll let the panel come in in a minute, but Susan, a report from Shelter this week was saying, you, you were alluding to the, the private rental sector, the private rental sector, according to Shelter's figures, has doubled in 10 years. That's a staggering figure, but it's only going to get worse, I presume, because people can't afford to buy their own homes and fewer homes are being built. Now, shelter are calling for 12,000 homes to be built every year in Scotland. Is that ever going to happen? The, the reason that the private rented sector has doubled is, is, the, is the increase in people, um, is the buy-to-let mortgage phenomenon, which... Um, I think what happened was, as you know, in the sort of early sort of uh, you know 2000 to 2008, people were able to make a lot of money off property, and that was what they did. Um, and then from 2008 to now, as property prices have plummeted, there are a lot of new people coming into the market and seeing it as a way of making money. And that that's the reason why the private rented sector has grown the way that it has because more people have bought houses to rent out to other people rather than to live in them themselves. But well, that's part of the problem, isn't it? Because landlords now have the pick, don't they? So they're going to turn away the most needy people, the people that find it most difficult to get a reference, to get some cash together. 
and, and to approach a landlord yeah. and get a rent. But the reason that the reason that the, the, the people um, who the, the reason that the private rented sector, in my view, is absolutely essential to to you know for people. The, the, the reality is that the social housing waiting lists are off the scale. So actually, what is the what is the preference? Somebody tries to get a private rented sector property. They're trying to do that if they're on low income because they cannot get a social house. So actually. Um, no matter how much uh, the, the, the government tinkers around the edges of trying to make it harder for buy to let landlords, actually the solution is building more affordable housing. And that's, and that's why I said that if you want to shift the private rented sector away from these hundreds of thousands of reluctant amateur landlords or, or landlords who are focusing on their bottom line rather than creating a home, and there are lots of landlords who do focus very much on creating a home. It's not all bad. Um, you cannot dismantle the private rented sector without having a home for somewhere else, somebody else, to, uh, for, for another home for somebody to go and live in. So actually, the, the crisis at the moment is around the building of social housing. And Sharon, how, how can you come in there and help, help the people that are the very people that are the most needy and the least likely to have either the money for a deposit or the good references of a good bank account? Well, actually, financial exclusion has become um, more of an issue for um, tenants in the private rented sector recently because they don't have a socially responsible landlord looking out for their needs and being able to direct them to organisations like Scott Cash, for example, who work in partnership with a range of banks um, to help um, reduce those barriers. So, for example, we'll work with the Royal Bank of Scotland, with Barclays, and more recently with Virgin Money, where we will open up the accounts on behalf of tenants or our customers and we don't um, need to um, ask for photographic ID. Those uh, uh, issues have been relaxed. Are us. they not seen as the enemy though? By some, there is a, a real lack of confidence in banks for many of our customers. So we have to try very hard to help our customers understand the benefits of being banked and particularly given that we're just about to migrate in Glasgow over to Universal Credit, you will not be able to receive that benefit unless you have a bank account. So it's absolutely crucial that we help people understand why it's important to get a bank account now, how to successfully operate that bank account without the fear of charges, um, and how to use that bank account most effectively to make the most of their money more generally. Thank you. Have any of you a question at the moment? Yes, I knew you all get braver just as the time runs out. <laughs> okay, we'll take the first the gentleman here, th three men. Any women going to ask a question too? Excellent, we've got five questions lined up, so we'll have to keep the answers sharp and, and, and the questions not, right, too, um, not too long either. Uh, Gavin McClellan from Abelour Children's Charity. Um, just about to pick up on a few things that folks have said, and the question's coming from me personally rather than speaking on behalf okay. of Abelour. Um, one thing Abelour has done just very recently in its new strategic plan is to align ourselves to a grander vision of being there to um, make a, a contribution to a fairer society rather than simply just focusing on our, the, our core mission. Mm -hmm. And I think in doing that, we would want to align to a far bigger vision. And I think it's great that um, there's this manifesto coming from GRF. Um, what was interesting, what Jim said, was that it has a huge diversity of responses within it. And I wonder whether there's a risk, therefore, that there's going to be a pick-and-mix approach taken by policymakers, and so therefore we're still going to have this very piecemeal approach. And I would contrast that with, we keep hearing, uh, uh, Satwat said, we've been talking for 40 years about childcare, we keep talking, and yet when we look at you know, the Nordic examples, or Scandic examples, or the Finnish example, we see grand visions that have been implemented. Now, perhaps these have been over-mythologised, but I wonder, maybe we'd get more traction if somehow we could get a grander vision that we could all get, get behind and be more courageous to the private sector, as you, as you suggested. Sorry it's been a rambling question, nope, that's, but I think it's about the, thank you, risk Gavin. about the pick and mix and also secondly about if we want to be more courageous with the private sector, who are then these mm -hmm. other allies that we could be working against? It'd be interesting to hear about a little bit thank more. Thank you for your points. So that, what, what do you think? I mean, uh, our approach to childcare, two piece meal? I think it is, and I think that was certainly what we found in the Commission. I think one of the other um, things that we stated was in Scotland we have a vision for children and we have a vision for childhood. We don't have a vision for child care. And what, I mean, we've had the statements made that we wanted to be part of the economic infrastructure. We see it as being integral to raising attainment 
and in, in improving outcomes, but we've yet to see that coalesce into a single vision. And then, we can, as you say, we can then work out how we're going to get to that vision at the same time as doing some of the things you need to do in the here and now to support families who've got that need for childcare, to support them out of poverty, to support them into work. And I think that's, that's what struck me also about what Susan was saying, is that we've got the here and now situation, for example, with housing, and it's how do we address that to stop it getting worse and to have the best quality experience for, for tenants at the same time as working towards the longer term vision. And I think that, you know, there is a danger of a bit of pick and mix in there, but you actually need to have that variety of solutions there and those options there for us to look at, to be able to work out how we're going to get to the, you know, the vision of a Scotland free from poverty, which is something I would dearly love to see in my lifetime. Gavin and Satwat, you both mentioned the Scandic mm -hmm. examples. I mean, we all aspire to the Scandic examples, but you're talking about pick-up schemes and wrap-around flexible childcare, which are great ambitions. How on earth do you fund that? Well, we funded it. Um, it's not been easy. It's been at a cost to the organisation, I think my board would say. But actually it's about demonstrating that there are models, that you can do them and you work in partnership with your communities and families. I mean, we've been able to do it partly because the place where we run the daycare from has been given to us effectively rent-free by the local housing association. So it is about those partnerships and seeing how we get different parts to work together to come up with the solutions. Thank you. Right, another question. One of the, yeah, um, uh, we'll, take, yeah we'll take yours next. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Clemmie from uh, Glasgow Caledonian University. Um, I thought it was interesting to hear lots of people talking about the role of the private sector and the importance of kind of holding them to account and having um, a kind of minimum standards. I think Susan's work with the private rented sector is really important um, with the statistics and stuff that have come out from Shelter recently as well. Um, so I just wondered kind of practically taking this forward whether that is something that could be worked on from a variety of different angles in terms of setting out that kind of minimum standard for various um, uh, pieces of work within the private sector, whether that's um, housing, um, Sharon alluded to um, the role of the banks, um, and also uh, fuel poverty has been touched upon by a couple of people as well. So whether that is something quite practical to take forward in terms of um, you know, holding people to account and having some transparency in what's going on in the private sector. Thank you. Susan, briefly. I think, I think that goes um, back directly to, to the point that's brought up in the manifesto and, and what I feel myself, which actually, if you look at the private rented sector as an example in housing, um, there is a lot of regulation and there's about to be more regulation, um, both for letting agents and for landlords. Now, um, there's always uproar about that. When, we, when these regulation proposals come through, we looked at them all at the beginning and just forgot about them. And the reason for that was that we were already doing it all, so it's actually not a hassle for us. It's just a tick box exercise because everything's in place. The challenge is that um, there, will be, there will be landlords, corporate and individual, who morally buy into the concept of quality and do it anyway. And there'll be others who cut corners because they're maximising their financial return. And all we can really do with those ones is make it harder for them to cut corners by improving you know, by legislation, and but the enforcement is critical, and um, I'm sure local authorities have good reasons why they can't en they can't enforce the regulations that are there, but they do not act hard enough, fast enough. And I think the example of Govan Hill is, an, you know, Govan Hill has been an issue for a long, long, long time, and the wheels of government, both local and national, have moved too slowly. They are now moving, but actually, in Glasgow, there are probably another. 20 areas of the city where we need that same level of enforcement. So actually it's about a combination of winning hearts and minds and getting people to understand the importance that their, in, that their investment actually affects people's lives and for those that don't buy into that making sure that the enforcement is appropriate. That's it. Sharon, come in there. I mean, the unfortunate fact is that low income groups are not profitable for mainstream financial services um, and they, they never will be. And alongside compelling banks to release data on access to banking we should also be compelling banks to 
uh, release data on borrowing habits across different areas so that we as policymakers and um, practitioners are able to target social finance provision at the areas that it's, it's needed most. And in, in America, for example, there's a social investment tax that is levied on financial institutions that are not helping low-income groups, and that money is diverted into social finance providers to build um, a capital loan fund to, to, to lend to low-income groups. So it's those types of approaches that I think are really important for um, both Scotland and the UK government to take forward and, and, and really push that, that agenda because we know it works. We know that £57 million pounds is borrowed annually in Glasgow alone from non-standard lenders. Social finance providers are actually meeting around 5% of the need. So there's a huge gap there. And if we can work more um, strategically with financial mainstream services, we can absolutely make those available to low-income groups in a different way. Thank you. We are running out of time. Yes, let's take your question next. We'll try and get in as many as we can. Are we allowed to run over at all? Yeah, yeah, we'll keep going then. Um, the lady behind you. Yes, you. And then you. Hi, I'm gonna, my name is Lucy. I'm gonna cover up my Trussell Trust badge just now. Um, I think um, we're talking about solutions to poverty. What will it take? And I think that one of the elements that may have been missing from the discussion is proper taxation. So, Sawai, you were challenged on where will the money come from? Well, people don't discuss the fact that people and corporations don't pay proper tax. So the, the low-income people are, ta are targeted and it's a sort of constant blame game of individu individual choices and, and spending choices, which is blamed for the reason why we can't afford this, we can't afford that. But people don't, but there's not a proper discussion about the fact that if, even if you were on benefits and, and bought cigarettes and bought alcohol, which is an unfortunate and wrong stereotype given to low-income mm -hmm. groups, you probably paid more tax than Facebook last year. So, thanks. Thank you, Thank you for that. Yes, and you've been waiting patiently here. We'll get the mic to you. Anybody at this side of the room? I'm not doing it. Thanks, um, Nathan Sparling. I just um, wanted, I know Sally, you posed a question earlier about whether we should blame bad politics. And I think um, one, of, one major problem I have is that um, on Tuesday, the UK government will pass a bill that um, removes the income related poverty measure mm -hmm. um, from, from basically removing the link between income and poverty. And I think that is the biggest mm -hmm. bad politics move that can ever happen. Um, and the Welfare Reform and Work Bill will, will, will do that. And I think that's one of the biggest problems that we'll have is that it will remove accountability and transparency in government figures. So we'll never actually be able to measure poverty without work like GRI. Thank you. Um, we've got two people waiting over here. Yep, thank you. And then we may have to call it a day. Rob Gowans from Citizens of Ice Scotland. Um, it's often said that these things that um, work is the best route out of poverty, but well, that sort of leads on to a couple of questions. One is, I wonder what the panel think of how important the quality of work is. It was already mentioned about the prevalence of zero hours contracts and, um, and unpredictable hours. And the other is, how do we avoid poverty for those who are unable to work because of illness or disability or caring responsibilities? Thank you for that, Rob. Donna. You've been very quiet there. Yeah. How important is it to have a job or is the quality of that job just as important? Um, I think no one's recognised for the quality of jobs. Nurses aren't recognised anymore as being saints, you know, because of the long hours they have to do and they don't have time for proper lunch. A lot of them don't look fit anymore. There's a lot of changes in your society um, and I think you know how, like, being a cleaner, people have pride in that now. It doesn't matter what job you do, it's how you feel in your mind. That's the problem. If you're stigmatised or looked down, if you still feel good within yourself, and there is, and, and, and with that, as he was talking about the tax, I mean, the big, big companies, they're not, they're getting away with tax and then, and then we're all getting to jail, do you know what I mean? For, mm -hmm. for um, or getting sanctioned or something. I know I'm kind of a kind of. But it's a very unfair system, and everybody needs self-esteem and feel self-worth. So it doesn't matter if you're rich or poor, and what job you're in, if you feel good about yourself, you know, and that's what's the matter. 
I, I think everybody's still talking about the statistics. We need to talk about the solutions. We can we do? We can talk to each other. The poverty truth brings people to the testament. The people who live with the problem and the, and the decision makers, they bring them together. They have mentoring systems where they can mentor and explain why these changes need to be done this way. You know, so that's a two-way thing. And, and I don't think that's answered your question, but I just had to say that. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, it's welcome. Um, yeah, what about people who are unable to work, who, who, who simply cannot hold down a job for reasons of health or caring reasons, whatever that is? I mean, how do you keep people like that out of poverty? I think that's when it comes back to having a minimum income standard across society, irrespective of whether or not you're in work. And that is one of the things that... Um, one Pound Family Scotland is involved in the Scottish campaign on welfare reform and one of the things we talk about is a benefits system which treats people with dignity and respect and keeps them out of poverty. I mean, that's, you know, when you're talking about the vision of a poverty-free Scotland, that's what I would like to see, a, a Scotland where we have a minimum income um, standard, where we recognise everyone and value people irrespective of whether or not they're in paid work and recognize that different people different families have different needs possibly at different times in their lives and what we need to do is to make sure that we've got a system which stops people falling into poverty but i think the quality of work i mean many of the parents that we work with want to work and they want to work for the reasons that donna's just spoken about in terms of what what they want to do for themselves and their families but they actually want work that's going to fit in with their families, not be instead of what they're having to do. They want to be recognised in their role as parents first and foremost and have work that fits around that. And, where, and they don't talk about sort of, you know, progression in work as in a hierarchy in terms of management or whatever. They want something that they feel they can get some value from where they can give something back and have something that they can feel proud of, but that doesn't make them fall deeper into poverty and that doesn't conflict with the other priorities that they've got in their lives. Right, sorry, we're, we're being told that we need to wind up. Uh, somebody was desperate to make a point. Yes, can you make it very quickly, please? <laughs> this is a question for Satwa. Mm -hmm. I was going to, uh, I was going to sort of keep it to myself, but a few issues have been raised today and I'm wondering, if you're talking about welfare reform, is a basic income scheme even part of those discussions? Because it would tick so many boxes about reducing pressure on the housing stock, keeping mm -hmm. people out of poverty, and ensuring decent quality of work. Um, so I sort of couldn't keep it to myself. It's possibly a conversation to carry on afterwards yeah. if we're being kicked out, sorry. I think, I think we'll have to do that. I'm very sorry, um, I will wind up now. You, you've only had a chance to have a glimpse at the manifesto, so go away and study it and question your politicians, but also question businesses and people in the third sector and, and debate it amongst yourselves. Come back to the Roundtree Foundation. I'm sure they would be happy to hear from you. Poverty is costly. Scotland can't mm -hmm. afford poverty. Why should, we, why should we allow it to continue? But what we do need is solutions that aren't just quick fixes, but, but do work. Let me thank you all very much, in particular to our speakers, to Donna, to Satlat, to Sharon and to Susan. For, for their time today. Thank you all for your time. I'm sorry we're having to wind up, but I'm sure they'll hang around outside and have a quick word with you. So the final word must go uh, to, thank you to the Joseph Rowntree Foundation for this. And Jim, I'll just let you finish off. To, just to thank all of you for coming. Uh, special thanks to our speakers and to Sally, um, who is cheering this on her day off. So extra special mm. thanks to, to Sally for that. Um, We've ranged pretty widely in a short time. Um, we're keen to get into some tricky issues uh, for Scotland within current and forthcoming powers. Uh, how we can use our coming, we think, coming tax powers, how they interact with the benefit system, how they interact with other areas that we've been talking about today, um, and how we can do, as I said at the start, the heavy lifting of tackling poverty at all levels, of course, government and parliament, but we can do this heavy lifting in every part of Scotland, in every sector. So thank you very much for joining us and for sticking with us today. Thank you.